Up with some general background, whatever. What do you know about how the station actually started down here? It was Marconi. It was a Marconi site first, and that would have been uh, Marconi's first transoceanic message, I believe, it was 1907. 07. Teddy Roosevelt was president because the first message across the ocean, Teddy Roosevelt sent, sent to King uh, it was B. Edward Albert, uh, Bertie. Yeah, Bertie died in 1910. So it would have been uh, Prince uh, King, uh, well, everybody called him Bertie, Elizabeth's, uh, Victoria's oldest son. Anyway, he sent a greetings message from the United States, and uh, then they sent one back. And of course, that came from the was from the Marconi site in Truro, right? Or was it Wellfleet? Uh, Wellfleet, well, you know, yeah. yeah, right. And that's they got all that information up there about that. But this, then they started they, this building. These buildings down here were started about soon around that time. Then RCA bought out Marconi. Why did they move it down from Wellfleet to Chatham? Uh, I'm not so sure they, that they didn't have a transmitting stations up there because they had many other transmitting stations besides this one at that time. They had the big Marion plant, which had uh, several of these big towers. Dad worked at the Marion one for a short period of time before they sent him to Chatham to work at this one. So and that was after World War I because Dad was, had to get out of the Navy in, the, in 1919, uh, I guess he got out of the Navy. Yeah, because he was, it was the year after the war was over because he was still ferrying troops back, <laughs> they were ferrying troops back home and, uh, and, and uh, flu victims of the 1918-19 flu epidemic were unbelievable. And uh, then uh, they sent him down here. He was, got his electrical training in, in board ship and uh, became a, an electrician and generating power plant operator aboard the Agamemnon or the Leviathan. He was on t either one of those ships at different times. And then RCA hired him on the basis of his abilities to do run the power plant. So they sent him down here, and uh, that's when he started. That would be about 1922, possibly, possibly uh, 23, because he married mother in 20. Three or twenty-four, and he'd been here a couple of three years by then. Is that how he first came to town? Was working at the station. That's right. Yeah. So, so that's the so only reason you're here is, there, is because your dad worked at the station. I mean, that's well, that's why, that's why they, how they got married. Yeah. And then my older brother was born. He was born with, uh, let's see, I think, yeah, he was born. Dad was still working at the radio station, and he was born in 1924. So he was still at the work. No, no, 20, 25. How old was he? My brother was born 25, I think that's right. Anyway, he was born a, a couple of years, you know, before Dad left the RCA station and went to work on his own garage business. So what, what year was it that your dad first got here? I'm, I'm, I'm not positive of the exact year, but it would be about, see, because I, I haven't got any information about when he left the Marion plant and came yeah. to Chatham. I am guessing like about 1922, and I won't be more than a year off one way or the other, 23, 24, because he's married mom. In 24, and Earl was born in 20, 24, 25, just 1925, Earl was born, my older brother. And uh, and then after Earl was born, he left the ICA station, got tired of him, and went into automobile business, Slim's Garage, which remained his business for 40, 42 years, I believe it was. So, uh, but while he was at the, up there, of course, he met a lot of people, a lot of men that were Chatham people, because they have quite a crew, as you can see here. And uh, so, where shall we go from there? Well, um, what was job there? It start, yeah, I mean, yeah, he was hired after. Was he a soldier in World War One? No, in the Navy. Okay. The Navy in World War One. He was in the Navy. Yeah. And he was on board, board ships. ships. Yep. And uh, transporting troops, which was pretty grim. Yeah. Maybe you could just start out, you know, talking about how he got. We sort of covered this a little bit, but. Yeah. Maybe you can start out just so it can stand on its own. Actually, say in there so, something about your dad, like my dad first came to town. Just sort of word it that way so I can edit it on its own. Okay. Well, and then we can start at the beginning and tell me about you know what kind of work he was doing there and and what kind of business that the RCA actually did. You know down yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. They were, 
Well, when he started uh, to work for RCA, uh, he was moved to China. Could you actually say, I usually don't direct people this way, but could you actually say my dad? Okay, so sure. Da uh, yeah, right. My, <laughs> my dad, <laughs> everybody's known as Slim when he said that. He uh, came to Chatham about 1921 or 22 to work at the RCA station in Chatham Port, which uh, RCA had just had recently purchased from the Marconi Radio Company. And he was a power plant engineer up there, ran the power plant, and which generated the the uh, uh, the, the high frequency, high voltage spark gap transmission. In those days, it was all ICW, which means Morse code, and uh, dots and dashes, generated by a very high sp speed, high frequency alternator, powered with a diesel engine in the in the. Uh, power plant, which still stands at the corner of the entrance to Riders Cove Boatyard and, uh, and Route 28. And uh, that power plant building is still there. And uh, that was his home office, so to speak, while he, while he worked for the radio station. And uh, along with many other men, as many as must be must be about 20, 20 odd there, and probably not all in the picture. I would imagine most of those guys are probably ex-soldiers, just like your dad was. Well, they're all about the same. Service of the. They're all about the same age, except the little girl standing on the back step there. Uh, some are older, but most of them are thirties and forties, I'd say. Dad would have been that because he was born in thirteen and thirteen. Twenty-six. He went in the navy. So yeah, Dad was in his thirties at this mm -hmm. time. So uh, my, the uh, the other, this I say in the, on this photograph here, I only know a few of these people because this is so long ago. But they're the people that worked up there, and and uh, so from, from there on in, it was a matter of you know working for the radio station. And uh, as I said before, he got tired of the. I don't know exactly why. Of working for RCA and went into business for himself. He left the radio station, but the station, of course, was operated. If you want any more on the station, it was operated all those years, right up until just MCI bought it and MCI closed it down what, five, six years ago, or seven or eight years ago, something like that. What type of work did your dad actually do on a day to day basis? Like when he got up in the morning, what, what was his day to day activity? Day to day activity was probably was to go right to the power plant. I don't know whether they broadcasted 24 hours a day, but they certainly received 24 hours a day. There's somebody on duty at the desk all the time taking incoming messages because their basic job of the RCA station was communication with all the ships at sea, primarily, obviously, the Atlantic. <laughs> because, uh, as a matter of fact, they were in touch with the. Uh, Ship that was in that that was picking up the survivors of the Titanic in 1912. Yeah, and this radio station was in contact not with the Titanic but with the ships that were out there picking up survivors. And their radio see because everything relay because we stick so far out in the ocean that this is a closest proximity you can put a land based station mm. to to cover the North Atlantic, and that's why it's here. And uh, so. Uh, the uh, station was uh, in operation all through the 20s and 30s and 40s. The Navy took it over, and we had a raft of naval personnel in town. They took over the Hawthorne Inn, which is now defunct. It's now the Hawthorne Motel. The inn was a three-story wood frame building, much like the Chatham Bars Inn, but not quite as big. And uh, they were that was where that was their barrack, so to speak. And there must have been well over a hundred. Uh, mostly men, but there were a few, what would be waves, yeah, naval waves of the Navy. No, are you talking about the guys that were stationed out the naval, I mean, the, uh, yeah, the naval air station? No, there. that's World War I, and that closed in 1930, 31, or maybe even before that. I tell you, Bob Hardy's the expert on the naval air station, but it was closed because I remember it when I was a little kid, Dad drove over there, and we looked around, some of the buildings were still there. They'd taken the big hangar down because it was a, a liability to leave it there, you know. And uh, but the the guard houses were there, and some of the buildings were still there. That the the uh, the naval, naval air station had no affiliation whatsoever with the radio station, uh, because that was World War One. The naval air station was built built for primarily for that. And uh, as soon as the 30s uh, 
I don't know if they closed it before the depressions hit or not, but Bob Hardy would know. Anyway, that uh, has not no bearing on it. But to back to the RCA station here, it was, I say, a military operation. And of course, they changed it. By that time, the broadcasting bit was still, you know, uh, much more, uh, let's say, much more updated and much more sophisticated and much better. But they still used nothing but code, ICW, because that's foolproof about making mistakes. You know, over the air, words can get mumbled, jumbled, and and you make mistakes talking, uh, and uh, or you can miss, come and can misread. But when it's coming out in dots and dashes, because you don't want to make mistakes when you're sending military messages and things, because <laughs> that's not good. And uh, so it was. Uh, they had radio operators up there and everything. Because a shuttle bus used to go by here every hour or so, back and forth between the Hawthorne Inn and the and the uh, radio station, shuttling personnel back and forth. And. Uh, so that was, and the station was very busy, I'm sure. I mean, I don't know militarily speaking, but I, it had to be because they had to warrant all, having all those uh, sailors and officers and stuff to, to man the place. It had to be effectively used, and I'm sure it was. And uh, after the war, of course, it returned to the RCA's and its civilian, all the ships at sea status, so I kind of I don't like to overuse that phrase. All the ships at sea sounds like the radio announcer, the uh, the newsman. Forget his name, but doesn't matter anyway. The uh, it went back to that business, and it was, uh, as I say, operative up until about the time that RCA sold it to MCI. And I'm going to gestulate and say that was ten, maybe twelve years ago. I think more than I think of it. It's quite a while back, and then it just became defunct, and closed, and. They've emptied all the buildings of all the uh, all the stuff. They're just empty. You know, they moved out all the equipment and everything. So uh, Fletcher Davis' father worked over there. He'd be one that could perhaps tell you more about the more current. Uh, his dad went to work there in the 30s, I believe. Lewis Masson, right next door, at least up on the hill, he was an operator there for quite a few years, radio operator. And he's the, you probably know him, he's the guy that plays the pipes all around. And uh, he was a radio operator for a long time right here. And I'm trying to think of anybody else that has worked there. So I say recently, but 